This is Faith at Home with Pastor. This is uh, Sunday, May 14th, Mother's Day. So, uh, and, and, it's, and it's kind of neat that we're uh, going to be getting into chapter 3 of John. Uh, it talks about, uh, you know, God to love the world. So uh, he's saying his only begotten son. And of course, uh, we think about our mothers, our grandparents, people that God has brought into our lives that have shared with us uh, the, the love of Jesus. So, so yeah, it's kind of appropriate that, uh, that we're kind of getting to that with, with Mother's Day. So I want to, uh, let me go ahead and, uh, and begin with prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much uh, that we have, uh, you know, think about Mother's Day, and we just like, think about the women that you have brought into our lives. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we think about uh, our mothers, and, and uh, certainly uh, we thank God for Christian mothers who have shared with us the, the faith, the love of Jesus. Uh, just help us, whether a, a male or female, just help us all to be able to share with others uh, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, faith at home, and, and looking at the Gospel of John. Uh, bless our study this day, Lord. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, uh, we had uh, John chapter 2 a little bit uh, last week uh, with uh, the wedding of Canaan. Uh, this nice little picture there. Uh, and... Um, and yeah, you know, well, what, what were some of the you know, things that we saw with regards to, um, you know, his very first miracle and uh, turning water into wine? You know, you'd think that he'd be a little bit more spectacular, which that's pretty spectacular. Uh, but uh, certainly meeting a, a human need. Um, you know, of all the, all, and I still think there's a connection. I saw this somewhere. Of, of all the miracles, why choose this? But, uh, but in an earlier part of John, it talks about uh, Jesus referred to her as woman, which, which is a term of respect. Um, and, um, and, and he says, the hour has not, my hour has not yet come. And uh, it's like, well, you know, which, which is kind of also a phrase, a strange phrase to, you know, because his mother's asking him to help out. And he says, my hour has not yet come. So what is Jesus referring to? Of course, the hour uh, is really talking about his passion and death. And, and this is the beginning of his ministry. That's not going to happen for another three years. Uh, but his sights were set on the cross. And when we, when we connect woman with the hour has, has not yet come, and it's like, well, it will. It will quite soon. I think there's a connection with Genesis 3 where uh, the, the prophecy of, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, you will strike his heel. Uh, he's talking to Satan. And uh, talks about the offspring of the woman, and here Jesus refers to his mother as woman. And then he talks about his passion, hour has come. Uh, I, I think this is uh, kind of a, a shout out to what happened in Genesis with the prophecy of the coming Messiah. And, uh, and that hour that Jesus is referring to is, is that hour where he will come and and do what was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, and I think this kind of leads into uh, uh, what we have with verse 11. Let me read to that. This is the first of his signs that he did in Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory. The disciples believed in him after he went down to Capernaum, his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out, out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. One of the, one of the, all of the people will oftentimes try to point out scripture and, and, and the apparent inconsistencies. And what they would say is contradictions. Uh, they'll, they'll point to the, the resurrection where it talks about one angel and one gospel, two angels and another gospel at the tomb. Uh, and of course, like I said, that's been debunked so many times as far as, you know, eyewitness accounts. Uh, you know, will differ, but uh, but the, the 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 time frame. You know, because all the other gospels talk about Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple, 
uh, as taking place after Palm Sunday. Uh, so Holy Week. And, and, and here in John chapter 2, it talks about his very first miracle, which is the beginning, and, and everyone agrees that it was a three-year ministry. Jesus began his ministry when he was 30, and it continued until he was 33. So three years ministry. And, uh, and, and the driving the money changers out happened right before he went to the cross. And so this was toward the end of his ministry. And right after the miracle in Cana, we have the same thing referenced. So uh, is, the timing seems inconsistent with the other Gospels. Uh, and, and, and so, and so uh, someone who will uh, criticize Scripture or, or critique it, uh, it's like, can you explain that? You know, can you explain that? And different commentators will say different things. Uh, some will say, well, I mean, he certainly could have done it more than once. You know, who's to say that the only time that he drove money changers out uh, was uh, Holy Week? prior to his crucifixion. Uh, he uh, went to the Passover many times, you know, and, and so once when he was at the Passover, you know, and, and it was a practice that they've been doing for some time. And so, so it would make sense that whenever he sh went to the Passover, it's like, there they go again. <laughs> They're doing the same thing over and over, and over again. Uh, when he did it uh, on during the Holy Week, it's like that probably wasn't the very first time he'd done it, uh, and so he could have certainly done it more often. Yeah, I mean, and, and that that could be an explanation. So I mean, it's certainly uh, this isn't uh, an inconsistency that uh, it's not a microphone drop. It's like here's proof above all proof uh, that the Bible is is should not be relied on. Uh, but I still think John is much deeper than that. I really think the Gospel of John. Uh, there, there's, there's some deeper meanings and, and deeper significances. And, and just as I mentioned about the hour has not yet come, we hear reference to Passover I mean, and the passion of Jesus, his death and, and resurrection, uh, throughout the Gospel of John. And it is always kind of a shout out <laughs> to, to what's to come. You know, and so who's to say that this isn't um, already looking forward toward that Holy Week, uh, you know, because because even when we get into some of the, uh, it's like the the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus's prayer. That's in the middle of John, and we, you know, that's in John, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, uh, you know, where uh, that the high priestly prayer. You know, there's there's you know, John's not very into this whole. Chronology, you know, it's like what happened first. You know, he's pointing out things, always looking toward uh, a, a greater meaning. And so, so this could very well be a, a reference to to Holy Week, even though we're at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Because, like I said, that's not a concern of John. He he, he assumes that you know all that stuff because he wrote his gospel after all the other gospels were written. So all the other gospels were already out there. Uh, and so he assumes that you know all of that stuff, but uh, but he's always he's he could very easily have put this here, uh, looking toward the the crucifixion. The gospels are not written like a Franklin planner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that's a, that's a that's a word from the past. <laughs> People still use Franklin planners. Well, back in the day we did. I know. I, I I used them. I I have uh, you know. But you used, yeah, I mean that was the thing to do. Took me a while to remember that title. But <laughs> <laughs> what was that called again? Yeah. Uh, Franklin Planner. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, uh, you know, there are people who have, have kind of uh, pointed to Mary as uh, kind of uh, pushing the little bird out of the nest. <laughs> it's like, be gone, you know, go. Um, and, um, and maybe some of that, but um, uh, 
but yeah, yeah, it's it's you know even even you know my time beginning of my ministry is not yet come. Um, but then again, if it if if not, why is he getting disciples? You know, he, he's he's already gathering disciples around him. You know, it's like obviously he's starting something because the disciples were gathered before this happened. And so he's with his disciples when he, you know, so, so I kind of get, get a, a sense that he had, had begun his ministry. Uh, and this just happened to be the very first miracle. Um, but, but to your point, it could very well be that um, it's one thing to gather disciples around you. It's another thing to, uh, to do a miracle. Uh, because that's, that's where you really gain attention. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, and so, yeah, so up until this point, things were kind of, um, you know, not hidden per se, but, uh, but, it, you know, he's kind of getting things going. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, all of a sudden he does a miracle. Um, but, but that's also kind of somewhat consistent, you know, because how many times do you remember Jesus doing a miracle and, and telling them the people don't say anything? <laughs> Keep it to yourself. He's like, why is that? Why would he not want people to share what he's done? Seemed to always get out. Well, I, I know. Yeah, it didn't ever seem to work. Which, which you know, did you know? Uh, Jesus obviously should have known that that it's going to get out. You know, uh, maybe in his human nature. Um, but I think part of that is uh, is. He didn't really want them to try to force him uh, to push his kingship, which that's not really what he came to do, not an earthly king. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I think there's always a danger in Jesus' mind that people were going to try to, try to force him to, to, to be king in, in a way of which he did not come to do. Um, you know, so, so yeah, it's like, you know, I don't want to be overwhelmed by all these people wanting, you know, because, because many times Jesus kind of, uh, it's almost like a rock star, you know, he has to sneak away. Uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, I don't know if you, you know, the, the whole hype right now, uh, the, the whole, you know, Taylor Swift is a big thing going on right now. I don't know if you ever heard in the news with this era's tour that she's doing. Uh, but anyway, I remember seeing a clip on, on the Instagram or something. Uh, but, uh, but, but they were pushing a, a janitor's cart that had mops and brooms and all that stuff. And I guess, I, supposedly, she was hiding in that cart. <laughs> and she was getting from one place to the next. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, just this, this uh, uh, hysteria going on. And so, yeah, Jesus, how many times did he sneak away? He got into a boat to go to the other side of the lake, and all of a sudden, people went around the lake. <laughs> so, anyway, Bob? Is there anything that gives us insight to uh, Mary's insight to tell us, sort of, listen to it, you know, you're going to do something special? Like that one could wonder what, what she knew, what, what might have happened at home. I mean, Jesus is 30 years old at the time. Yeah. He's been working, we understand, in his father's trade as a carpenter. I mean, I mean, the, the household had to, had to make a living somehow or another. Yeah, and one would wonder, what's happened at home that made Mary think he can handle this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, at, there's speculation. You know, because cause I'm not sure we really fully knew what Mary knew. I mean, she knew, so, knew, she knew something. She, she, she knew that there was something. I mean, uh, from the from the get go, you know, beginning with the Magi, <laughs> you know, it's like the you know, and and now well, beginning with Simeon. Well, that was after the Magi. You got the Magi. Uh, well, no, uh, Simeon would, would have been first. Magi. You know, we always we always see, think of the Magi at Jesus' birth, but he was a year and a half old at the time. Uh, so so Simeon would have probably would have been the first. And, you know, I never really thought about chronology here, but Simeon would have been the very first to point out to Mary. Uh, other than other than the angel appearing to her in a dream, and Elizabeth, and you know some of that stuff that's going on, uh, but but from a prophetic standpoint, a human person, 
saying to Mary uh, that there's something about this child. Uh, and, and then, of course, the Magi visiting as well. Um, and the whole dreams things, because, because I mean, the, surely and certainly Joseph, you know, because the, the dreams appeared to Mary prior to the birth of Jesus, but but from that time on, the angels seemed to appear more to Joseph than to Mary. You know, appeared to Joseph to go to Egypt, appeared to Joseph to, to return from Egypt, uh, and and so and Joseph certainly would have relayed that uh, to to Mary. Um, you know, and, and of course, you know, what was going through their minds when he was, uh, you know, all of a sudden they realized that he was not in their company. It took them three days to realize that they thought he was with a relative, uh, and all of a sudden they couldn't find him. Uh, so they had to go back to Jerusalem, and they found him in the temple. And this has been three days later. He's been hanging out in the temple for three days. And, uh, and of course... Couldn't find him, maybe the, uh, the scholars there. I know, yeah, yeah. And of course, in in their frustration, can you can imagine the parents being pretty frustrated. It's, it's three days, uh, and then they had to travel all the way back to Jerusalem. I mean, Mary, Mary and Joseph weren't perfect people, and so you can imagine they probably would have little. There, there was some irritability. <laughs> I would think there would be a little irritability, and, and and really, and they said that you know why did you treat us so? And then of course, he responds. Uh, did you not know I'd be in my father's house? And, and the comment you always have with Mary is she pondered the things in her heart. She pond, you know, and so that goes to your point. What what was that pondering? What what? And so when you get to the wedding of Canaan, um, yeah, there was a situation that Mary couldn't do anything about, and I'm not sure she really knew how Jesus could solve the problem, but she. I think she had a feeling that he could, <laughs> in some way or another, he could resolve the issue. Uh, and, and it's like, I'm not sure how he's going to do it, but just listen to him. Just do what he says. Uh, trust me. And, and, and of course, who's to say that, uh, that, you know, 30 years, there could have been very, there could have been times where, uh, I'm not saying necessarily a miracle or whatever, but, uh, uh, Jesus could have very easily have gotten them out of difficult situations before. You know, I don't think it's beyond rational thought to think that that didn't happen at some point in time. You know, uh, because John, at the end of his gospel, says Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in this book. <laughs> you know, if you look at the very last chapter of John, he says that, that very thing. Jesus did many other things that are not but these are written so that you may have life and have it to the full. And so, yeah, he did many other things. And so, I, I would think it makes sense that, that Mary saw things from the past that would lead her to think that he could take care of the situation. But what's different from this situation than previous is that now it's being done in a public way. I think it's always been under wraps before, maybe in, the, in their own household. But, but now it's here public. And Jesus knew that once it's out there, once it's out there, then it's, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no putting the toothpaste back in the bottle. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so um, many more things is to come. Um, so uh, interesting as, as, we, as we speculate that. Uh, and like I said, Jesus did miracles, and after that, driving out demons, miracles, there's a lot of things that Jesus did. Uh, and the Pharisees were observing all of this stuff. Uh, but we haven't gotten there yet, but what was the straw that broke the camel's back for the Pharisees? All of these miracles, healings, feeding 5,000, he did so many things. And the Pharisees observed all of that, you know, it's like, just kind of let it go. But at, 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 there was a point where Caiaphas, like, we... We cannot let it go in anymore. This is this is it. This is this you know. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. And 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 that event was the raising of Lazarus. Because when you had the raising of Lazarus, that's where the, the Pharisees got together. It's like we got to put a stop to this. Because not only is he doing all these other things, he's now raising people from the dead. <laughs> you know, which makes one wonder. It's like 
well, why don't you believe? You know, it, it, you know, it, it's beyond understanding that he could do all these miracles. But now he's raising people from the dead. You would think that 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 would be the straw that breaks the camel's back as far as unbelief. And so, I, why why wouldn't they all of a sudden believe? And of course, that goes to what I preach today and what I'll preach on Pentecost: is you can't believe without the spirit. You know, and, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't have the spirit. Well, they humanly. What it amounts to is they worship their religion, yeah. their establishment, rather than I me. Mean, raising somebody from the dead, shouldn't we pay attention? Yeah, you would think. Shouldn't you pay attention? You know, after the resurrection, they couldn't find the body. You know that they searched for it. You know that they had to have searched for it. If they suspected that the disciples may have stolen the body, they came uh, up with an alias for the uh, the guards. So they had to come up with a story. Uh, and they paid the guards off to say that, that, that they stole the body. Uh, which is interesting that the guards would actually do that because that was a death sentence to them. That, that, they, that they, you know, but, but somehow they believed the Pharisees, oh, that's okay, we'll take care of you. <laughs> well, well, you know, you won't die from, from but, but say, so they had to come up with a story rather than believe, oh, maybe he did rise from the dead. <laughs> you know, so... Um, Anyway, uh, so yeah, it's not an inconsistency at all. That's not John's intent. You know, well, what was that phrase you said, Randy? John's not into chronology. You know, you said some... He, he's not writing a Franklin Planner. Oh, Franklin Planner. That was where the Franklin Planner came in. Okay. Um, anyway, so, so the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? And once again, this happened, this happened during Holy Week. You know, him, Jesus and his disciples were, were, this is after Palm Sunday procession. They're walking around Jerusalem. They're looking at these great buildings. And, uh, and Jesus said, destroy it, and I'll raise it in three days. It's so like, all of a sudden, we're thrusted into the future. Now, we're going to go back to the feeding of the 5,000 and some of those other things. Uh, but I think from the get-go, uh, John is already has his sights set on the cross. Um, verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he had, was in Jer Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now here's also something interesting that you don't see in any other gospel. Um, you, don't, you don't see um, spoiler alerts. <laughs> in the other Gospels. You know, you, you know, you go in order, you don't talk about the resurrection before it happens, you know. It's like all the other Gospels are building up to the crucifixion. And then you got the resurrection. You know, but John, in chapter 2, says, oh yeah, by the way, uh, verse 22, when, there, when he was raised from the dead, it's like, you know, if you've read the Gospel of John and not read the other Gospels, you're going to say, what, what is he talking about raising from the dead? You know, it's like, if you're hearing about Jesus for the very first time, uh, all of a sudden, you know, talk about a spoiler alert. You know, you, you, you've already read the end of the book before you read the rest of the book. Uh, it's like, you just, you, just, you just messed it up for me. You just already, you know, like I said, John knows that you know all this stuff. And so he references the resurrection, even though chron chronologically it hadn't happened yet. Uh, and so, yeah, therefore, after, after, after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered he had said this. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again. You know, and I, I said this before, and I think it's, it's pretty profound in that, um, that I believe everything Jesus said prior to his resurrection, he taught, he said, the mirror, all the stuff he did, was all intended to be looked upon in retrospect. That it wasn't until Pentecost, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, that they were able to look back and recall the things he said, the things he did, 
And then they were able to kind of put two and two together. It's like, oh. And of course, that is inspiration. You know, and, and, you got, and of course, someone could, could critique the scripture. It's like, you know, how good is your recall? We're talking three years. You know, it was 2020. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the fifth Sunday, sixth Sunday of Easter. Do you remember what you did three years ago? <laughs> you know, and so, so you can say, you know, there's no way that, that we can rely on recall because we might mess up things. Uh, it's like you go on a fishing trip. That fish keeps getting bigger and bigger every time you tell it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was passed down through word of mouth often during that three years. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I remember back three years ago. Well, you know, Joe told me that. Oh, yeah, Jim said the same thing again a little later. Yeah. You know, so it, it's because it was all by word of mouth storytelling, uh, it, it kept it fresh in their mind. And, and also, you got to understand, they were much better at that than we are today. You know, they didn't have, you know, our attention span is so much shorter today than it was 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, preachers are pretty much told, don't preach a sermon be more than 15 minutes because you're going you're gonna to lose your people. My sermons are anywhere from usually 12 is my average, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. If I go beyond 15 minutes, it's, it's a rare thing. Now, now I'll go back 40 years ago pastors you grew up with. Did they ever have 12 minute sermons? <laughs> it went beyond 20 or 30. I'm guessing 20 at, 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 at minimum. 25, probably even 30. And, and I don't think that was, of course, as a kid we probably didn't like that. But, uh, but, but I mean, for the most part, I don't think that was a big deal because we, you know, we had a much better attention span today, not so much. But, but the time of Christ, um, they relied on oral, it's called oral tradition, you know, where you shared stories uh, and, and, and so yeah, their memory was much better than ours is today. So, so I give them credit to that extent. But, but the point I really want to make is that's, that's the definition of inspiration. That God en allow, enabled them to remember. The two men on the road to Emmaus you know, uh, they were recalling all these things, didn't make sense, but Jesus opened their minds to the scripture uh, when he was speaking with them. And that's when they, they later relayed to the disciples, like, it was amazing, this guy spoke and, and he just opened our minds. I think that's inspiration to a certain extent. God opened our minds and then God opened the minds of these writers. Uh, so that they were, and so everything Jesus taught and said and, and did was meant to be looked upon in retrospect. And so after the day of Pentecost, and really, it was not just the resurrection, uh, but you know, one story I always like, I always think is kind of humorous, is when Jesus was ascending into heaven, that's going to be this Thursday, the ascension of our Lord, when he ascended into heaven, the very last question the disciples asked of Jesus, you know, you have one more question to ask, what are you going to ask? You've got one more. And they said, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's the very last thing they asked of Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's like, had, 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 had you not been listening? <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm not here to restore the kingdom of Israel. That's not, I, I'm, I'm here to, for a spiritual kingdom, not a political kingdom. That's not why I came. You know, but Jesus wasn't mad. Jesus didn't scold them. Jesus simply said, go to Jerusalem. Just stay there for 10 days. You're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in, in 10 days from now. It'll all make sense. So I was like, you know, don't worry, it'll all make sense. <laughs> and, and so they went back to Jerusalem, 10 days later, Pentecost happened, and then all of a sudden they were enlightened, and, and, and they understood. And so then they were able to look back three years ago to, to this event, uh, or whenever he said this, which I think is Holy Week, but still look, look back and said, yeah, I remember him saying, saying, destroy this temple in three days. I didn't understand at the time, but, uh, but now, now it makes sense, because he died, rose again three days later. Uh, and he said that, I'm referring to my body. So, so yeah, all of a sudden, everything, everything made, made sense. Um, 
Okay, uh, moving on to chapter 3. I kind of did talk about Mother's Day. We're going to get to chapter 3 a little bit. Now, now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, you hear its sound, you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So John chapter 3 is, is uh, Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. Now I don't know where this occurs in Jesus' ministry. It's not his first year. I really don't believe it's his first year. Uh, because Nicodemus wouldn't have I mean he didn't come to, to Jesus because he turned water to wine you know I, I don't think that that would have been enough for Nicodemus uh, to see something in Jesus uh, I don't think Jesus' reputation was built just with one miracle I'm sure several things have happened up until this point that led Nicodemus to be a true believer. He'd be someone who's like, you know, I don't think we can dismiss <laughs> what Jesus is doing. And these other Pharisees might dismiss it. I don't, I don't think we can. And so he appears to Jesus at night because he's still fearful. He's afraid of the other, of, of, um, you know, of the other Caiaphas and Annas, and Caiaphas, you know, the, the leaders, the high priest, he's worried that what they're going to do. And, and now later on, when Jesus died, him and, and Joseph and Mary Matthias, they were bold enough to ask you know, for Jesus' body. Um, and I think some of us know that not all Pharisees were unbelievers. You know, there were many Pharisees. When, when, when they had that trial in the middle of the night, there were a lot of Pharisees that weren't happy with Caiaphas. It's like, what are you doing? You know, and even how the trial came about, it's like, this isn't right. Did they speak up? Maybe not, but I, I think they probably shared their displeasure and questioned. They eventually went along with it. You know, but but I'm sure that they question, is this really right? Um, and um, and Peter and and Peter and John when they were preaching, uh, there was a a, uh, a Pharisee that uh, his name's escaping me right now. You remember uh, who that is in the Book of Acts? Okay, Gamaliel, thank you. Yeah, he, he's like, uh, if this is of God, there's nothing we can do to, to stop it. If it's not from God, it'll, 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 it'll fall apart. It, it'll just go away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and, and it said, said, you might find yourself fighting God, Buster. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's, that's, that's not a good thing to do. That's not, that's not very wise. Um, so, so, yeah, what, what, Gamaliel wasn't necessarily a believer. He wasn't a follower of Jesus. Uh, after his resurrection, um, he still thought there was, you know, he still was true to the Jewish faith. Uh, still thought the Messiah was going to come, but at least he was wise enough. Unlike Caiaphas <laughs> and some of these others, at least he was wise enough. He, he'd be along the same ilk as Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Although I, I believe they were believers, Gamaliel still was smart enough to say, you know, if this is of God. There's nothing we can do to stop it. So why are we, you know, just just let let let, let it play out. And when it played out, and when it didn't go away, did Gamaliel uh, believe eventually? You know, we don't know. Um, there's rumors that some people believe that Pilate became a believer at some point in time. You know, we don't know. Gamaliel could very well have been a believer at some point in time. We know that there were people higher up in Rome. Um, John has always believed that, that John, 
you know, new people in uh, in in the Roman court. And, you know, I, I, that's why I think John was able to get access uh, to to the to Pilate's courtyard. It's like you know when when most people wouldn't be able to get access. I think John was able to get access. So 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 many people believe that John somehow or another uh, had some inroads. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, that's. Um, so, so yeah, that whole kind of thing with Nicodemus, of course, uh, him, like many of us, just from a human standpoint, couldn't get the spiritual understanding of Jesus' words. You know, they, 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 they just kept on thinking logically. It's like, what do you mean, born again? Uh, you can't answer a second time in, in your mother's womb. You know, um, and of course, uh, going on, uh, Jesus eventually is like, are you a teacher? You don't understand. You know, it's like, I, I love that, that, that phrase of Jesus. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Um, I, I think that's one of the funniest things that Jesus ever said. Uh, it's like, you know, he's always very professional. <laughs> and, and, but, but finally, just like, you, you can tell it's a head scratcher for Jesus. Are you a teacher and you don't understand these things? Truly I say, truly, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that who believes in him may have eternal life. Th that is such a profound statement. You know, Jesus himself is making a connection to something in the Old Testament. Uh, and we talked about, you know, that, that we have parallels, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, and, and so many of these things that eventually is brought out, such as just as Jonah was in the belly of a well for three days, the Son of Man might be in the, in the tomb for three days. I mean, we, we, you know, things are mentioned uh, that will parallel things that happen in the Old Testament. Many people will make the connection without it being stated. You know, when we get into the I am passages, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I think uh, Jesus didn't have to say, you know that good shepherd is talked about in Psalm 23? Uh, you know, he didn't really have to say that. People made that connection right away. That's why they accused him of blasphemy. Uh, but when Jesus actually makes a connection, he makes a connection because uh, he probably assumes they wouldn't make it on their own. Uh, and so Jesus going to the cross and being hung on the cross is parallels what happened with Moses and the serpent. And so when you hear that, then you can go back to Exodus and, and you can go back to, um, uh, you know, this is after, you know, there, it's their wanderings and, uh, and they're being bitten by snake and all of a sudden a snake was put up on the pole and you looked that you're healed. And then and Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to be going to, going to do for you on the cross is similar to to what Moses did, and uh, and just just invoking Moses' name, all of a sudden will bring to mind, yeah, you know Jesus and everything he did really parallels Moses and everything that happened. Forty years in the wilderness, forty days in the desert, uh, Exodus from Egypt, slavery. Uh, rescued from slavery of sin, uh, you know, just all these things you can, put, you know, I actually do that sometimes, I actually bring up a chart and just start paralleling uh, the Exodus with Moses and then parallel uh, that with Jesus and, and, and his passion and death and resurrection. Uh, but here uh, we see a specific reference to that. Uh, and then we have 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he did, has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that he may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We, we say 16 all the time. But what about 17? Well, we'll end with that. Uh, I did not come into the world to condemn the world. But so that the world might be saved through him. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but this, that the world might be saved through him. Really? Uh, I mean, what, what's profound in that statement is we're saved through Jesus. But if we don't have Jesus, we're condemned, but it's not Jesus' fault. And I think that's what's pretty significant here. And, and that kind of goes, I'm getting too theological here, and you want to talk about double predestination. You know, in the Baptist church, Calvin thought of double, double predestination, that God predestined some to be saved, some to damnation, some to salvation, some to damnation. That, no, God does not predestine anyone to, to damnation. That goes strictly, verse 17 of, of John 3 is, is just one of many illustrations. We're damned not because of God. We're damned because of our own sinfulness. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And, and if you don't have faith, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not saved, but it's not because of God. It's because of your unbelief. It's because of the hardness of your heart. Uh, because you love darkness more than light. You, know, you don't want to come to the light. And I think that also brings out why is there so much hostility toward Christianity. And of course, people will say that, and I, I read all the time in Facebook and Instagram and all this stuff, like, like, what do you mean Christians being persecuted? Uh, it's like right now, is a perfect example. You guys are able to go to church. You can worship. Nobody's knocking on your doors. No, no, no one's telling you to not worship. You, and, and it's true. We have a lot of freedoms uh, that not all nations have. And then and, and we're in a period of time where not everyone was free to worship as we are today. So, so yeah, there's a lot of privileges. But, but that being said, Christianity is still ridiculed, and there is persecution. And, 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 and why are people so unbelievers, so irate with Christians? Um, because Christianity is not really us, but Scripture. Christianity exposes the deeds of darkness. It exposes evil. And, and when you like a particular evil, <laughs> uh, you don't like that to be exposed. And, and, so, and so you get very defensive. And that defensiveness will cause you to... You know, so, so there's no... And people say that, well, I'm neutral. Live and let live. You believe what you want. You know, people will say that, but but when when you really expose Christianity, you know, it, it invokes you know people being angered and irate because you're telling me I can't do what I think I, what I want to do, uh, and we can. You can talk about pretty much any sin. Uh, I think that's part of it. We're pro-life. We're pro-life. And when you talk about, uh, you know, telling a woman what they can do with their body, I mean, it's like, you know, and, and so you get angered because you're being told something that, you know, you don't want to hear. There was something that happened yesterday where this uh, country singer got up. She's talking about how to make the world a better place and stuff like that. And it's exactly the thing, get married and have kids. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and even that, people might get angry with that. You know, it's like, how dare you? 
you know. Um, anyway, but just think about those, those deeds of darkness and um, um, just being told that I can't do something. Um, and society keeps going towards this whole gender identity and all that stuff. It's like uh, uh, that I should be able to do what I want. You know, and, and it's like, well, Scripture's clear that, that we're not really free to do whatever we want. Um, you know, the big argument years ago when we talked about, you know, doctor-assisted suicide kind of thing. You know, it's like, I should have the right to do what I want with my own body, uh, even, even if I want to end my life because of whatever I'm going through. Uh, and, and, but, but from, a, from a scriptural standpoint, no, we don't have that right. You know, it, 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 it's God. God has the right to end life and not us. Uh, but, but, but from a humanist standpoint, I mean, you can understand, I, I don't necessarily, it doesn't, you know, confuse me to understand why that thinking is there. You know, because from a humanist standpoint, well, yeah, this is my body, I'll be right, do whatever I want. Uh, but that's, are humanists speaking. If you want to really look at what God says, <laughs> that does that oftentimes man's wisdom is, is different than God's wisdom. You know, and, and you look at God's wisdom, it's like we don't always understand. But this is this is God. You know, um, and 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 if and, and that's the thing, people if if you if you're really going to believe in God, then you really ultimately need to do what God tells you to do. And that's where people have a difficult time. I believe in a God, but I believe that I'm still able to do whatever I want. And so that's the deist understanding of God. That there's a God out there that looks down upon us, but we still have the freedom to do whatever we want. Uh, that's, that's kind of um, uh, having it both ways. <laughs> um, and and um, yeah, there's, there's a, I'm trying to think of the cliche. It's not coming to me right now. But, uh, but yeah, just, just having it both ways. But anyway, let's, uh, we'll, we'll stop there. That's a good way to pick up. John 3, 16 is always a good way to end and a good way to begin. So, so let's uh, close with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be in and abide with us all. Amen.